My Own True Ghost Story by Rudyard Kipling Narrated by Robin Nixon As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert. The City of Dreadful Night Somewhere in the other world, where there are books and pictures and plays and shop windows to look at, and thousands of men who spend their lives in building up all four, lives a gentleman who writes real stories about the real insides of people. And his name is Mr. Walter Besant. But he will insist upon treating his ghosts, he has published half a workshop full of them, with levity. He makes his ghost seers talk familiarly, and in some cases flirt outrageously with the phantoms. You may treat anything from a viceroy to a vernacular paper with levity, but you must behave reverently towards a ghost, and particularly an Indian one. There are in this land ghosts who take the form of fat, cold, pobby corpses, and hide in trees near the roadside till a traveller passes. Then they drop upon his neck and remain. There are also terrible ghosts of women who have died in childbed. These wander along the pathways at dusk, or hide in the crops near a village and call seductively. But to answer their call is death in this world, and the next. Their feet are turned backward, that all sober men may recognise them. There are ghosts of little children who have been thrown into wells. These haunt well curbs and the fringes of jungles, and wail under the stars, or catch women by the wrist and beg to be taken up and carried. These and the corpse ghosts, however, are only vernacular articles and do not attack sahibs. No native ghost has yet been authentically reported to have frightened an Englishman. But many English ghosts have scared the life out of both white and black. Nearly every other station owns a ghost. Uh, there are said to be two at Simla, not counting the woman who blows the bellows at Sairi Dak Bungalow on the old road. A Missouri has a house haunted of a very lively thing. A white lady is supposed to do night watchman round a house in Lahore. Dalhousie says that one of her houses repeats on autumn evenings all the incidents of a horrible horse and precipice accident. Marie has a merry ghost, and now that she has been swept by cholera, will have room for a sorrowful one. There are officers' quarters in Myanmar whose doors open without reason, and whose furniture is guaranteed to creak, and not with the heat of June, but with the weight of invisibles who come to lounge in the chair. Peshwa possesses houses that none will willingly rent, and there is something, not fever, wrong with a big bungalow in Allahabad. The elder provinces simply bristle with haunted houses and march phantom armies along their main thoroughfares. Some of the Dak bungalows on the Grand Trunk Road have handy little cemeteries in their compound, witnesses to the changes and chances of this mortal life in the days when men drove from Calcutta to the northwest. These bungalows are objectionable places to put up in. They're generally very old, always dirty, while the Kansamar is as ancient as the bungalow. He either chatters senilely or falls into the long trances of age. In both moods, he is useless. If you get angry with him, he refers to some sahib dead and buried these thirty years and says that when he was in that sahib's service, not a kansamar in the province could touch him. And then he jabbers and mows and trembles and fidgets among the dishes and you repent of your irritation. In these stack bungalows, ghosts are most likely to be found, and when found, they should be made note of. Not long ago, it was my business to live in Dak bungalows. I never inhabited the same house for three nights running, and grew to be learned in the breed. I lived in government-built ones with red brick walls and rail ceilings, an inventory of the furniture posted in every room, and an excited snake at the threshold to give welcome. I lived in converted ones, old houses officiating as stack bungalows where nothing was in its proper place and there wasn't even a fowl for dinner. I lived in second-hand palaces where the wind blew through open-work marble tracery just as uncomfortably as through a broken pane. I lived in stack bungalows where the last entry in the visitor's book was 15 months old and where they slashed off the curry kid's head with a sword. It was my good luck to meet all sorts of men, from sober travelling missionaries and deserters flying from British regiments, to drunken loafers who threw whisky bottles at all who passed, and my still greater good fortune just to escape 
a maternity case. Seeing that a fair proportion of the tragedy of our lives out here acted itself in dak bungalows, I wondered that I'd met no ghosts. A ghost that would voluntarily hang about, a duck bungalow would be mad, of course, but so many men have died mad in duck bungalows that there must be a fair percentage of lunatic ghosts. In due time, I found my ghost, or ghosts, rather, for there were two of them. Up till that hour, I had sympathised with Mr Besant's method of handling them, as shown in The Strange Case of Mr Lucroft and other stories. I am now in the opposition... We will call the bungalow Katmal Dak Bungalow, but that was the smallest part of the horror. A man with a sensitive hide has no right to sleep in Dak Bungalows. He should marry. Katmal Dak Bungalow was old and rotten and unrepaired. The floor was of worn brick, the walls were filthy, and the windows were nearly black with grime. It stood on a bypath largely used by native sub-deputy assistants of all kinds, uh, from finance to forests, uh, but real sahibs were rare. The Kansamar, who was nearly bent double with old age, said so. When I arrived, there was a fitful, undecided rain on the face of the land, accompanied by a restless wind, and every gust made a noise like the rattling of dry bones in the stiff toddy palms outside. The Kansamar completely lost his head on my arrival, he had served a sahib once. Did I know that sahib? He gave me the name of a well-known man who has been buried for more than a quarter of a century and showed me an ancient daguerreotype of that man in his prehistoric youth. I had seen a steel engraving of him at the head of a double volume of memoirs a month before, and I felt ancient beyond telling. The day shut in, and the Kansamar went to get me food. He did not go through the pretense of calling it Kana man's victuals. He said retub, and that means, among other things, grub, or dog's rations. There was no insult in his choice of the term. He had forgotten the other word, I suppose. While he was cutting up the dead bodies of animals, I settled myself down, after exploring the Dak bungalow. There were three rooms beside my own, which was a corner kennel, each giving into the other through dingy white doors fastened with long iron bars. The bungalow was a very solid one, but the partition walls of the rooms were almost jerry-built in their flimsiness. Every step or bang of a trunk echoed from my room down the other three, and every footfall came back tremulously from the far walls. For this reason, I shut the door. There were no lamps, only candles in long glass shades. An oil wick was set in the bathroom. For bleak, unadulterated misery, that duck bungalow was the worst of the many that I have ever set foot in. There was no fireplace, and the windows would not open, so a brazier of charcoal would have been useless. The rain and the wind splashed and gurgled and moaned round the house, and the toddy palms rattled and roared. Half a dozen jackals went through the compound singing, and a hyena stood afar off and mocked them. A hyena would convince a Sadducee of the resurrection of the dead— the worst sort of debt. And then came the ratup, a curious meal, half native and half English in composition, with the old Kansamar babbling behind my chair about dead and gone English people, and the wind-blown candles playing shadow bow peep with the bed and the mosquito curtains. It was just the sort of dinner and evening to make a man think of every single one of his past sins, and of all the others that he intended to commit if he lived. Sleep for several hundred reasons, it was not easy. The lamp in the bathroom threw the most absurd shadows into the room, and the wind was beginning to talk nonsense. And just when the reasons were drowsy with blood-sucking, I heard the regular, let us take and heave him over, grunt of dooley bearers in the compound. First one dooley came in, then a second, and then a third. I heard the dooleys dumped on the ground, and the shutter in front of my door shook. There was someone trying to come in, I said, but no one spoke and I persuaded myself that it was the gusty wind. The shutter of the room next to mine was attacked, flung back, and the inner door opened. Uh, that's some deputy assistant, I said, and he has brought his friends with him. Now they'll talk and spit and smoke for an hour. But there were no voices and no footsteps. No one was putting his luggage into the next room. The door shut, and I thanked Providence that I was to be left in peace. But I was curious to know where the doolies had gone. I got out of bed and looked into the darkness. There was never a sign of a dooley. Just as I was getting into bed again, I heard, in the next room, the sound 
that no man in his senses can possibly mistake the whir of a billiard ball down the length of the slates when the striker is stringing for break. No other sound is like it. A minute afterward, there was another whir, and I got into bed. I was not frightened. Indeed, I was not. I was very curious to know what had become of the doolies. I jumped into bed for that reason. Next minute, I heard the double click of a cannon, and my hair set up. It is a mistake to say, the hair stands up, the skin of the head tightens, and you can feel a faint, prickly bristling all over the scalp. That is the hair sitting up. There was a whir and a click, and both sounds could only have been made by one thing, a billiard ball. I argued the matter out at great length with myself, and the more I argued, the less probable it seemed that one bed, one table, and two chairs, all the furniture of the room next to mine, could so exactly duplicate the sounds of a game of billiards. After another cannon, a three-cushion one to judge by the whir, I argued no more. I had found my ghost, and would have given worlds to have escaped from that dak bungalow. I listened, and with each listen, the game grew clearer. There was a whir on whir, and click on click. Sometimes there was a double click, and a whir, and another click. Beyond any sort of doubt, people were playing billiards in the next room, and the next room was not big enough to hold a billiard table. Between the pauses of the wind, I heard the game go forward, stroke after stroke. I tried to believe that I could not hear voices, but that attempt was a failure. Do you know what fear is? Not ordinary fear of insult, injury or death, but abject quivering dread of something that you cannot see. Fear that dries the inside of the mouth and half of the throat. Fear that makes you sweat on the palms of the hands and gulp in order to keep the uvula at work. This is a fine fear, a great cowardice, and must be felt to be appreciated. The very improbability of billiards in a dak bungalow proved the reality of the thing. No man, drunk or sober, could imagine a game of billiards or invent the spitting crack of a screw cannon. A severe course of dak bungalows has this disadvantage. It breeds infinite credulity. If a man said to a confirmed dak bungalow haunter, there is a corpse in the next room, and there's a mad girl in the next but one, and the woman and man on that camel have just eloped from a place sixty bars away. The hearer would not disbelieve, because he would know that nothing is too wild, grotesque or horrible to happen in a dak bungalow. This credulity, unfortunately, extends to ghosts. A rational person, fresh from his own house, would have turned on his side and slept. I did not. So surely as I was given up as a bad carcass by the scores of things in the bed because the bulk of my blood was in my heart, so surely did I hear every stroke of a long game at billiards played in the echoing room behind the iron barred door. My dominant fear was that the players might want a marker. It was an absurd fear, because creatures who could play in the dark would be above such superfluities. I only know that that was my terror, and it was real. After a long, a long while, the game stopped, and the door banged. I slept, because I was dead, tired. Otherwise, I should have preferred to have kept awake. Not for everything in Asia would I have dropped the door bar and peered into the dark of the next room. When the morning came, I considered that I had done well, and wisely, and inquired for the means of departure. Uh, by the way, Kansuma, I said, what were those three doolies doing in my compound in the night? There were no doolies, said the Kansuma. I went into the next room, and the daylight streamed through the open door. I was immensely brave. I would, at that hour, have played black pool with the owner of the big black pool down below. Has this place always been a dak bungalow? I asked. No, said the Kansama. Ten or twenty years ago, I have forgotten how long it was a billiard room. Uh, how much? A billiard room for the sahibs who built the railway. I was Kansama then in the big house where all the railway sahibs lived, and I used to come across with the brandy shrub. These three rooms were all one, and they held a big table on which the sahibs played every evening. But the sahibs are all dead now, and the railway runs, you say, nearly to Kabul. Do you remember anything about the sahibs? Oh, it is long ago. Uh, but I remember that one sahib, a fat man and always angry, was playing here one night, and he said to me, a Mango Khan, a brandy pani do. And I filled the glass, and he bent over the table to strike, and his head fell lower and lower till it hit the table, 
and his spectacles came off. And when we, the sahibs and myself, ran to lift him, he was dead. I helped to carry him out. Uh, he was a strong sahib, but he is dead, and I, old Mangal Khan, am still living uh, by your favour. That was more than enough. I had my ghost, a first-hand authenticated article. I would write to the Society for Psychical Research. I would paralyse the Empire with the news. But I would, first of all, put 80 miles of assessed cropland between myself and that duck bungalow before nightfall. The Society might send their regular agents to investigate later on. I went into my own room and prepared to pack, after noting down the facts of the case. As I smoked, I heard the game begin again, with a miss in bulk this time for the whirr was a short one. The door was open, and I could see into the room. Click, click, that was a cannon. I entered the room without fear, for there was sunlight within and a fresh breeze without. The unseen game was going on at a tremendous rate, and well it might, when a restless little rat was running to and fro inside the dingy ceiling cloth, and a piece of loose window sash was making fifty breaks of the window bolt as it shook in the breeze. Impossible to mistake the sound of billiard balls, impossible to mistake the whir of a ball over the slate, uh, but I was to be excused. Even when I shut my enlightened eyes, the sound was marvellously like that of a fast game. Entered angrily the faithful partner of my sorrows, Kadir Baksh. This bungalow is very bad and low caste, and no wonder the presence was disturbed and dispeckled. These three sets of duty bearers came to the bungalow last night when I was sleeping outside and said it was their custom to rest in the room set apart for the English people. What honour has the consumer? They tried to enter, but I told them to go. No wonder if these Uriahs have been here, that the presence is sorely spotted. It is a shame, and the work of a dirty man. Kadirbax did not say that he had taken from each gang two annas for rent in advance, and then beyond my earshot had beaten them with the big green umbrella whose use I could never before divine. But Kadirbax has no notions of morality. There was an interview with the Kansamar, but as he promptly lost his head, wrath gave place to pity, and pity led to a long conversation, in the course of which he put the fat engineer Sahib's tragic death in three separate stations, two of them fifty miles away. The third shift was to Calcutta, and there the Sahib died while driving a dog cart. If I had encouraged him, the Kansamar would have wandered all through Bengal with his corpse. I did not go away as soon as I intended. I stayed for the night, while the wind, and the rat, and the sash, and the window bolt played a ding-dong hundred and fifty up. And then the wind ran out, and the billiards stopped, and I felt that I had ruined my one genuine hallmarked ghost story. Had I only stopped at the proper time, I could have made anything out of it. That was the bitterest thought of all.